Those of you who are long-term listeners to the channel will know that I've lived something of a nomadic lifestyle. I've actually lived in quite a few different countries, and I've done a lot of traveling throughout the world. But one place I've never been to is South America. There's an otherworldliness to it that really intrigues me. So, when a story came up set in South America, I knew that I just had to jump at the chance to read it for you all. Another fantastic one from Dr. Creepin's Vault here, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. Well, my dear friends, we've once again reached Friday, and you all deserve to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. My friends call me Al, but, well, they are few and far between, the last one passing about twelve years ago. Now there's no one left to call me Al, and so I believe it's the right time to tell my tale to the world. I am a 96-year-old man, born September 4th, 1922, in Berkshire, Massachusetts. Being 96 years old, I can tell you that I've seen some wondrous and awe-inspiring things in my lifetime. When I was a young boy, I remember seeing people still riding horses and buggies out in the countryside. I remember listening to the radio at night for entertainment. I remember when DC Comics was first created and started selling their fantastic stories. And then, time passed, and soon we were landing on the moon, watching movies on smaller screens in our own homes, talking with people across the country instantly on computers, and building bombs that could vaporize hundreds of thousands instantly and poison the rest of the world for the remaining survivors. Yes. Along with the amazing wonders I've seen in this long lifetime, I've seen the myriad of horrible things that mankind has done to their fellow neighbours. A lot of the younger people in this world claim to be living in the worst of times, yet they have never known the fear that gripped the world during the early 1960s, when we all literally expected the entire world to explode. Tensions have died down enough so that people don't have the creeping suspicions that their own neighbours are agents of a foreign power, waiting for the opportunity to steal secrets of their country and use them to enslave the general populace. Yet, even when all these horrible experiences and realities flooded our world with despair, anger and hopelessness, I kept on smiling, content. You see, I experienced something during World War II, when I was serving with the OSS, or Office of Strategic Services, that changed me and my view of the world forever. A lot of men had their minds and souls altered by that tragic period of history, but I wasn't changed by any shell shock from being in the front lines, or from discovery of the massacres committed by the Nazis or the Empire of Japan. I never even went to the European or Pacific theatre, Yet I saw something worse than any soldier that was deployed to either one. I mentioned earlier, I worked for the OSS during the war. Now, for those of you who don't know, the OSS was the precursor to the CIA, created by FDR and based on the famous British SIS. Not only were we responsible for espionage action behind enemy lines, but we also were behind propaganda and subversion throughout the world along with our MI6 allies. Though many people in modern times may not be aware of it, South America was a huge battleground for the various intelligence agencies in the Allies and Axis powers. Mexico and Brazil, though officially neutral, were very cooperative to the Allies, while the nations of Argentina and Chile were sympathetic to the Axis powers and became major points of Operation Bolivar which involved transporting intelligence via radio and ship to Berlin. It was the fall of 1942, and being a young buck of 20 and filled with patriotic zealotry, I was ecstatic to be assigned my first field mission, taking place in the jungles of the Misiones province of Argentina. There had been reports that multiple agents of the Sicherheitsdienst des Reichführers, SAS, a.k.a. the SD, were seen entering the jungle with many different containers of unknown equipment. The SD was the intelligence service for the SS, so our higher-ups knew that something big could have been underway in the dark canopies where our recon planes were blind. 
preferring to be safe than sorry. They ordered me and six other agents to find these SD agents, capture them, and find out what they were doing. We were all deployed in Paraguay, as that was the safest place for us to be deployed without arising the prying eyes of the Nazi spy network. Every one of the seven agents sent into the jungle had code names corresponding to our founding fathers. The seven of us were John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Hay, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and George Washington. Washington was the one in charge, of course, and I was John Adams within the lot. I don't know why they assigned us these names. Maybe they thought it would boost our morale being named after America's founders. <laughs> I can't say. Whatever the reason, the seven of us were just glad we had each other, no matter what our names were, as we began our expedition into the dense jungles of Missiones. Ahead of us was a hot, humid forest of both beauty and danger that none of us had ever experienced in our lives. To this day, over all the exquisite pieces of art I've seen hanging up in museums across the globe, I place the lush, life-filled, primeval forest of Missiones as the most beautiful thing I've ever seen on this world. On the flip side of that coin, the eldritch monstrosities that awaited myself and my companions within those dense trees has forever instilled in me an instinctual terror of any forest, and I would rather be tortured to death than take another step into that place. We'd been briefed about our mission, but as we began our foray into the overgrown undergrowth, Washington filled the rest of us in on important details that only he'd been privy to. The SD agents, four in total, had been in contact with a local tribe native to the area and seemed to be cooperating with them in some way. One of the containers the SD were bringing into the jungle with them had been broken into and the contents photographed by one of our agents. Our expectations of what had been in the container could not have been more wrong. Instead of weapons, medicine, food or intel, the container had been filled with cultural items. There was golden jewellery, Nazi propaganda, history books, pictures of Adolf Hitler and his inner circle, things that were considered gifts in the civilised world. That was why our orders were to capture and interrogate the Allies wanted to know for whom these gifts were intended. That was also the reason all of us were dressed in Nazi soldier garb and given Nazi weapons. Even though only Washington and Franklin spoke German fluently, the higher-ups hoped our disguises would get us close enough to the four SD agents so we didn't have to shoot them. I can't say I enjoyed wearing the clothing of our enemies, but I was a man who followed orders and swallows his pride for the good of our nation. Washington continued to tell us we had an idea of the general area of where the SD agents could be, but that was about it. The plan was to get as deep into the jungle as possible the first two days, and then split into three groups. Two pairs of two would scout in opposite directions, while the remaining three would set up a base camp. The two groups would report back to later. However, right then and there, Washington told us how stupid that plan was, and that was not going to be how this mission went. We will be sticking together, using seven pairs of eyes to flush out signs of Nazi occupation. If we encountered any resistance, seven guns would be used to wipe it out. When we encountered the SD agents, seven bodies would be there to tackle them to the ground, and seven scary American faces would make them spill their guts. Everyone liked this plan far better than the first, and we continued our march with smiles on our faces. Our enthusiasm about the mission faded with the setting sun. An exhausting day of trekking through unknown territory, combined with seeing things like spiders bigger than our fists catching and eating birds, had drained us physically and mentally. All of us had spent time camping in woodlands, but none of us had ever experienced anything like this. Even when we stopped at night to rest, we didn't really get very much. Though we had a fire, it had to be a small one so as to not attract unwanted attention. Even with a small amount of light produced from the flames, we could see countless glowing eyes watching us from the foliage surrounding us. 
Our ears were bombarded with unfamiliar calls of creatures and the fear of being ambushed by a jungle cat, Nazi-friendly natives, or something still undiscovered by science dwelling in the dark depths of the jungle. Let us have fitful sleep at best. Though we always had a man on watch, even the knowledge that one of our companions had our backs didn't really help. When dawn came, we ate lightly and resumed our search. This became our routine for the next five days. Every day we would see at least one beauteous sight the jungle would be inclined to show us, and experience one more horror that awaited within these dense leaves and plants of the shadowy place. I can recall clearest on the third day that we discovered a hidden grotto with an amazing-looking pond. The sunlight gleamed against the water, making it shine brighter than any jewel I'd ever seen before. Yet, when Franklin went to fill his canteen, a snake larger than anything I'd seen sprang forth from the water and wrapped itself around him, both squeezing the life out of him and trying to drag him back into the water to drown him. Luckily for Franklin, the other six of us were upon the monster in an instant, hacking and stabbing the beast with our knives, killing it before it had a chance to kill Franklin or break any of his bones. Five of us, including me, found out later that night that giant snake tastes like chicken. It was in the afternoon on the sixth day that Jefferson discovered a boot print in the muck. We all took a look and collectively agreed that this was a Nazi boot, as we didn't think any of the natives would be wearing boots or shoes at all. Washington ordered us all to fan out, and we all began to slowly and stealthily follow the direction the track seemed to be going. Every once in a while, someone would report to the rest of us that they found another boot mark, and we would adjust our direction accordingly. Every track we discovered seemed more and more recent, and by the time the sun set on the sixth day, we came across the native village the SD agents were staying in. Now, in my old age, I've made it a point to try and expand my mind and rid myself of the many stereotypes of the different people of the world that had been all I knew in my youth. An example of this is my knowledge of Native Americans. Growing up, it was a typical Cowboys and Indians games with the rest of my neighborhood kids, and we portrayed them in a very unfair and very spiteful way. Traveling the southwest and northwest and visiting the tribes that lived there when I was in my sixties, I discovered complex cultures and skillful pottery, amazing beadwork and beautiful dances, with proud and kind people behind them all. Oh, no one culture is perfect, but I know that almost everything that had been pushed on me about Native Americans in my youth have been cruel misrepresentations. But, well, the tribe we discovered in those dark depths of the Argentinian jungle. They were every bad story of native cruelty and savagery come to life. The clearing we came across that housed the village was on a downward slope that put us about ten feet higher than the place. We could clearly see, even in the dying light, the village had a crude wall of cut logs surrounding it. From the light of torches that were spanned across the top of the wall, we could identify that, attached to the outside of the wall, were primitive spikes. Every spike was occupied by some part of the human body, arms, legs, or full torsos. Some were fresh, blood still slowly seeping out of the wound used to separate it from the body, while others were so old, they were almost completely skeletal. It was nice that all of us were still spread out from one another, so that no one vomited on anyone else but themselves. I think Washington was the only one who didn't wrench, thanks to being a veteran of the First World War. Gathering together, Washington began formulating a plan in whispers, when Hamilton suddenly interjected with, Hey, do you guys hear that? Washington was about to berate him for interrupting, but then the sound reached all of our ears, and he remained silent in order to listen. Through the typical nighttime jungle noises, there was a faint chanting upon the air. From the looks on the other agents' faces, I could tell that none of us were familiar with the language. Though I couldn't understand a single word that was being chanted, 
something in my mind was actively repulsed by the chorus of human voices. Whatever was being spoken just felt wrong, like no human should be speaking that dreaded dialect. It caused myself and Madison to shiver involuntarily. Our position on the high ground enabled us to spot two entrances into the village, on the left and right side of us. After grimacing from the sound of the eerie chanting, slowly growing loudly with every passing second, Washington told us the battle plan. We were to split into two groups, one for each of the entrances to the village. The group of three would see what was going on in the village and determine if the SD agents were there. If they weren't, the three would leave, meet up with the other four, and we would continue our search in the jungle. If they were there, the three would cause panic with gunfire and grenades. We were ordered to do our best to avoid killing the natives, but there would be no repercussions if we did. The SD agents, on the other hand, were only to be killed if absolutely necessary. Hopefully, the agents would attempt to flee out the second opening in the wall, where the group of four would capture them at gunpoint. It was myself, Hamilton, and Jay who were chosen to be the three infiltrating agents. Checking our weapons and ammo, we crept down to the wall and made our way slowly to the left entrance of the village, all the while gritting our teeth as the infernal chanting continued to attack our senses and sanity. When we reached the left opening in the wall, we were a bit surprised to find no guards posted there. We were a bit surprised, but chalked it up to good fortune, and doing our best to keep ourselves in the shadows, we sneaked into the village. The huts that served as homes within that unhallowed place were far worse than the war we'd encountered when we first entered the clearing. Clumps of skulls hung from every hut's doorway, some of them still bearing rotting flesh. Skin was stretched into canvases, where scenes of torture, rape, and general mayhem were somehow seared in with amazing detail. The smell was horrific, a mixture of rot and decay, fresh blood and fecal matter, burning meat and exotic spices. Hamilton and I had to pause to get our stomachs under control, while Jay wasn't fast enough and vomited as quietly as he could behind a hut. Wiping his mouth, he gave the two of us a determined look, which we shared back with him, and we continued our stealthy approach to where we determined was the centre of the community. Hiding in the shadows of a larger hut, we came across a scene of absolute monstrosity within the centre of the village. It looked like all the inhabitants, I think about seventy-five in total, were gathered there, their bodies painted completely black, wearing loose loincloths that seemed to be made of human skin. They all had their backs to us, facing a raised wooden platform around seven feet off the ground. The throng of natives was the source of that horrid warble that had reached a loud crescendo, forcing me to use all my willpower to not place my hands across my ears and scream to try and drown it out. Upon the raised platform, I could see a shrine and an altar, the shrine was a mixture of primitive art and tools. All looked to be fashioned from bones and leather of men, and of articles that were similar to what Washington had told us was found in the one container of the SD agents. I could make out the glint of weird-looking golden statues, a stack of books, a stormtrooper helmet, and a picture of Hitler mixed in with the horrendous tributaries. The SD agents were on the platform along with an older native man in an impeccable and abominable headdress, and a young girl. The old native man was clearly a shaman, dressed in ceremonial garb that matched the horribleness of his headdress. The four men in black leather coats each held on to the struggling and screaming girl's limbs upon the altar with one arm, and held aloft a chunk of black stone in the other. Triumphant and nefarious grins were plastered on their lips, and even at our distance I could tell their eyes shone with a destructive light. 
The shaman, with the headdress made of gold, gems and skulls, was raging a large, malicious-looking stone dagger with two hands above his head. He was shouting something I could not understand, as he brought the weapon over his head, but his intentions were as clear as day. My soul was screaming at me to stop this. Our mission was to capture and interrogate, but some primeval part of my instincts was telling me to kill them before it was too late. Too late for what? I did not know. But I knew something terrible would happen if we let that old man kill that young girl right there and then. I wanted to turn my head to Hamilton, who was beside me. I wanted to try and convince him that we needed to act right now and begin killing these fiends. But something told me the time to act was now, for the sake of the girl, for the sake of me, and for the sake of the world. I raised my Gavir, 43 and fired. I used to be a decent shot, but I hadn't taken the time to aim properly on account of the recoil. Yet something in the universe, whether it be fate, luck, or divine providence, was on my side that night, for my bullet missed my target, yet hid its mark. The sacrifice was still made, and I regret to this day that I hadn't decided to shoot earlier to allow my marksmanship to be more accurate. But I got the job done. The native priest, who was my original target, plunged the dagger down into the chest of the young girl uninterrupted, his weapon causing her frightened shrieks to cease and her fear-filled struggles to go limp. Yet, as the dagger was rushing down to meet with flesh, my bullet rocketed into one of the obsidian crystals the SD agents held aloft, shattering it into a million tiny pieces right before the dagger met its victim. A hundred things seemed to happen all at once after that. The crowd immediately stopped chanting and was silent. The shaman screamed in both fury and fear as the body of the girl began to spasm uncontrollably. The four SD agents backed away from the altar, stark terror adorning their faces. The three remaining crystals that had been held aloft were floating in mid-air, an energy that looked like black lightning arcing between the three of them and culminating in the chest of the child. The shaman was struggling to release the dagger and back away like the agents, but something was keeping his hands rooted to the dagger and the dagger stuck firmly in the girl's chest. One of the agents, as he backed away, spotted the three of us and shouted something, reaching to his belt for his sidearm. That was when Hamilton and Jay started unloading indiscriminately with their MP40s into the crowd and the figures on the platform. I wish I could describe the ensuing battle that began, but I can't. I wasn't focused on the battle in the slightest. In fact, Jay would tell me later that more than a few billets came inches away from hitting me as I stood there, seemingly in a trance. I told them all only once why I was just standing there, ignoring the chaos of the gunfight around me. And after none of them believed me, I changed my official story to a breakdown of nerves. It was easiest for me just to lie. But now I don't have to spin that facade anymore. I can finally speak the truth after decades of falsehoods. The dark portal was appearing from within the chest of the dead girl, the same hue of black that radiated and crackled between the three stones. It stretched from palm to palm, reached down to her right foot, but could not go any further. The final form of this dark portal was a half circle, its center line cutting straight from left palm to right angle, with the shaman and his dagger in the center. He was trying to break free of the darkness, yelling something and constantly shifting his hate-filled gaze from me back to the inky blackness. And that's when I noticed he was talking to something within that demonic gateway, for indeed, it was a gate. Black tendrils so void of light they stood out against the surrounding twilight, were slithering from the portal, slowly wrapping themselves around the man as he wailed in protest and horror. Ever so slowly, they began to drag him into the abyss, 
ignoring his thrashing and pleading, and I saw his flesh peeling off every inch of him that touched that unnatural darkness. It took only moments, but it felt like years before his head was the only thing left in our world, aside from the piles of skin on the edges of the gateway. He gave me one last look of absolute loathing before his face disappeared into the lightlessness of the void, his headdress falling with a clank to the platform. And then the eye appeared. It was massive, too big for the portal to reveal its true size, yet I still gazed upon its many pupils, its constant shape and colour changing iris, and the malicious intent it held for the one who had ruined its return to this earth. Its stare forever left a scar upon my soul, for I knew then that I was beheld with animosity by a being that could be considered a god. It had been so close to stepping into our mortal plane, yet this human, this bug, this insignificant assembly of atoms had stopped it dead in its tracks, earning me its eternal loathing. If it ever had the chance, it would do things to me, torture me with methods beyond the comprehension of what even the most sadistic psychopath could dream. Then it was gone, vanishing within the portal, as the three obsidian stones shattered and fell to the platform. It took a violent shaking from Jay to fully awaken me from my rapture, and I found out I'd missed the whole party. In front of me lay fifteen dead natives from the crowd, on the platform was the body of one of the SD agents, completely shot up, and what remained of the girl. Everything except her head and complete left leg had vanished into thin air. None of the other agents could explain what had happened to her. When Hamilton, Jay and I went to the entrance where the other four awaited, we came across another gruesome scene. Twenty or so natives were dead, Two of the SD agents were also dead, and the last one was dying, talking quietly with Washington as he bled out. I've never seen a man's face so pale with fear as Washington's was. Whatever that Nazi was whispering in his ear, it was nothing pleasant. As we approached, the dying SD agent noticed me, and turned to look at me with a smug expression of defiance. You may have stopped him from entering his kingdom this time, he said in perfect English. It may take a hundred more years, maybe even a thousand, but the world will run red with the blood of men again, and he shall be led through, and on that day the Reich shall welcome him and bask in his glory, and all you fools will beg for mercy and receive none. He will tear your souls apart along with this world, he will rebuild it in his image, and the glorious Reich shall be his angels for eternity. The SD agent hacked up some blood, tried to say more, couldn't, shuddered violently, and then died. The rest of the mission, well, there isn't much to talk about. We gathered what valuables and potential pieces of interest that we could, and made our way out of the jungle. The night I told the rest of the group what I'd seen, and they didn't believe me, I managed to ask Washington, in private, what the SD agent had told him. His face paled at even remembering his words, and all he could say was, Just the ravings of a dying, insane man. Nothing more. I found out a few years later that Washington hanged himself soon after the mission. His suicide note reading only, no proof that he was right, but no proof that he was wrong. I don't want to take that chance. God rest his soul. So, here we are, 2019. I'm the last surviving member of that team, and have no family left to tell this story to. My wife and son are both long dead, though they're officially still missing. That's the problem with being a spy. The only spies people want to hear about are captured spies and dead spies. 
I wish they'd had the decency just to go after me and leave my family alone. But decency is hard to come by in this world. And mercy and goodwill don't exist in the secret wars waged by the big governments of this planet. But no big public wars have covered the lands with blood again. And I'm always thankful for that. The rise of Nazis across the globe again is a bit disconcerting. But oh, they're nothing compared to the original. So I'm not too worried. The fact that Earth and everything living on it is in our power to create or destroy brings me comfort. I'm not saying that I'd be happy if we ended up blowing up the planet, but well, the idea that our own destruction is in our hands, that we as a species have a choice in our own survival or extinction, that's what helps me sleep at night. I've seen the alternative in my dreams. I see what happens if my bullet misses that black crystal, and the other worldly abomination those SD agents call God gets a full gateway to enter our world. I see that monstrous eye gazing at every living soul across the globe, unleashing torments and sufferings upon the general populace of the planet. I hear the screams and pleads for death as massive, black-clothed beings fly through the sky, their halos a blood-red swastika that drips pestilence and poison onto the people. I smell and taste the acrid air, filled with stench of rot and sickness, the iron of blood so thick you can taste it. But most of all, I feel the hostility towards me like a fire, burning away my skin and charring my muscle and bone. I awake screaming, and though my senses return and ground me in reality, I know that it's still out there somewhere, waiting for its chance to return. I know that it's still watching me with that gargantuan eye. And I know that it is still furious. So all the things I hate there, giant snakes, um, weird jungle people. <laughs> Sorry, uh, no offense meant there, but uh, I'm joking, of course. But yeah, quite an interesting story, that one. People of the older generations have all these stories to tell us, and they're all just fading away. Some never to be heard at all, I imagine. Oh, well, that's a bit too philosophical for a Friday night, isn't it? You all go out there and enjoy yourself this weekend. Of course, I will be back again with you on Monday, and I do so hope you're going to join me. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so... Come check me out, okay?